Welcome, Meatsmiths. You're listening to A Meatsmith Harvest. Restoring husbandry to prosperity. By means of the traditions of our fathers. This dialogue picks up where we left off in our last episode's conversation. You can find part one on our website, YouTube, or iTunes. If the content resonates with you, please consider supporting our team by going to patreon.com backslash meatsmith and donating a small monthly pledge. This goes directly toward more free media headed your way. Thanks for staying tuned for part two. Yeah, we were just talking about the ordering. Well, you, you were saying practicality. Like, this is really practical. Yeah. You know, because I think you're a guy. So, you <laughs> think really practically. Um, leaving the city, or I'll, I'll say, you know, leaving the city, dependence on the city, um, is, a, is a practical thing. Right. And I, I guess I kind of want to say the flip side, too. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of what you were saying. He wrote. He writes here in the first, the introduction. Scarcely had industrialism run two hundred years, than the great towns were reduced to such a state of economic bankruptcy. And here was the call for, to an apostle. Yeah. Um, economic bankruptcy that race suicide could be made the only practical agenda for the people. Mm-hmm. So pr- on a practical level. When you have your priorities flipped Mm -hmm. and you're only thinking about material, 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 Mm -hmm. and you have all these other causes that creep in, but they're perverted, Mm -hmm. then you just got to get people out of the way. Just just move bodies. People become the problem if they are not the goal, if they aren't the end of the city, the human flourishing. Then people are the greatest blight, which is exactly the ideology of the city right now. That's right. End of all. Yeah. So-called environmentalism. Mm-hmm. It's all. Humans are the problem. Mm-hmm. So we need to contracept them out of existence. Mm-hmm. Or murder them. And that's how or... you... Right. That's how we solve that problem. Yeah. Yeah, there was something else. I'm sorry. I brought in a really dark <laughs> oh, it's <okay>. little <laughs> thing. But... <clears throat> um... Yeah, there's a whole, uh, he works this out. This is another example of how both extremes of kind of the modern era, liberalism and communism, Mm -hmm. contribute to the same end, the same fragmentation. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is from Pope Pius XII. Okay. He says that uh, the subordination of the country to the town This happens with the result that the country becomes simply an annex of the town, stripped of its own specific character. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say, Marxism leads to the collectivization of agricultural labor. Right? We've seen this. That's what it do. Uh, On the pattern of a factory and the degradation of the countryside, which is reduced to be nothing more than than a reserve of manpower for industrial production. So that's what Marxism does. Mm -hmm. The fundamental principles of economic liberalism, so the opposite end of the spectrum here, apparently, Mm -hmm. produce the same results when the desire for gain on the part of finance capitalism presses with its full weight on the economic life of a people so that all the connecting links of the national economy are considered merely as a price mechanism that is exclusively from the point of view of markets and sales. So you get the dollar value as the highest value. Unrestrained uh, proliferation of legal tender is what economic liberalism results in, which means you get unrestrained centralized factory farming, mm-hmm. which is the same thing you get with communism. That's right. And they're, yeah. But they're apparently opposite systems, right? Mm. Um, mm. Although it is not the only cause of that exodus from the countryside, which is being deplored everywhere, the predominance given to the interests of industrial capitalism in the production and distribution of the national income has played its part therein. It would therefore not be a correct description of the deplorable phenomena to speak of it as the abandonment of the countryside. To be quite frank, we should speak of an exodus 
in order to bring home to everyone that a one-sided development of a country's economic life breaks up the human and social organization of a whole people. Unfortunately, or ultimately, for lack of a rural population endowed with the skill and initiative, the soil is either left uncultivated through neglect or exhausted by soil mining <laughs> and gradually loses its natural fertility. The inevitable result is a grave social crisis. <laughs> That's Pope Pius the Twelfth. Wow. But that so soil mining is such a descriptive phrase of what industrial agriculture, you know, like a monocrop of soy, mm -hmm. does to the soil. It's just a very different kind of environmentalism yeah. than we get from our popes today. Yeah. <laughs> it's Unfortunately, well, it's no. very educated. He's yeah. He's, he's been. He's actually telling us something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not just an ideology. There's there's something, there's a direction we can go, we can take from that. Yeah. Yeah, and there is even a, um, that's what I love about talking to a lot of young people that are thinking about, man, what is the best thing, uh, the best strategy for building land and for building soil, building topsoil, building the health in the soil? Because just like the Pope said, Pope Pius XII, it's, it's clearly like when, when, what the excess and the disorder of the city ultimately leads to is the Dust Bowl, is the destruction of the soil. Mm -hmm. um, and when that happens, that, that's like a little mini apocalypse. Mm -hmm. The city is over mm -hmm. and, and because it's wiped out the agriculture. Mm -hmm. So clearly the soil is pretty important. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's fun to see, you know, I talked to young agrarians who are building topsoil uh, through their particular farming methods. Mm -hmm. And th you can see holes in a lot of, especially materialistic ways of conceiving of the health of the soil. You know, um, you have lots of different strategies, rotational grazing. No, it's mob grazing, you know. Uh, no, it's planned holistic management. No, <laughs> you know, and we, we, keep, we keep trying to refine, polish the rock and, and refine mm -hmm. the terminology. And it's like, ah, oh, yeah, it works there, but it doesn't actually work here. So we got to do it something different here. And what you find is that there are too many variables. You can't centralize planet. You can't yeah. have a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And so the, the approaches to agricultural restoration that seem to last the longest are the ones that say, do what works for you where you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of what you get from some of the holistic management stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's regional. It's regional. Yeah. It's, it's not only regional. It's like, think about what the best thing you could do. I, I feel like the best metric for a plot of ground is, is a small plot of ground. If you could break it up mm -hmm. into small pieces, mm -hmm. into fragments, you might be able to do something about that little fragment next to the river on the hill or something you know mm. you could you could help that land out you could build that sail that's doable mm. and the unit that fits on that is a family mm -hmm. and so the best thing you could do what is the, i mean even all of these young agrarian families they're seeing it as they're working the soil what is the best thing for that soil it is their presence there mm -hmm. it's the fact that they're there mm -hmm. with their kids mm -hmm. and each other their spouse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're the ones that they, they were the environmental solution so people to the problem people <laughs> the world in families must be peopled the world <laughs> must be peopled as benedict says <laughs> yes because he was embarrassed that he liked beatrice that's but, right <laughs> yeah he had to have the world must be peopled <laughs> he didn't really want to get married no the world must be people but so. beatrice is very nice and so <laughs> he had to change his views on that because the world must be peopled uh-huh um well, which is the opposite of, you know, racial suicide. Is, right. Which is the other practical, Race, practical solution. Right. Yeah. Right. Just eliminate the people. Then you don't have the problem anymore. Yeah. Because in the end, you know, utterly neglected wasteland, pure wilderness is dying. You know, it's going to be a successive of a lot of things, a succession of a lot of things subject to natural disasters. But when you put people on it, you mm -hmm. can increase its fertility. But we don't even have to go as far to argue for that, that the land exists for the thriving of the people. Yeah. And that is the, that, that is the historical Christian 
philanthrop or anthropology uh -huh. uh, that is anathematized. Uh -huh. It can't be that in our modern formulation because yeah. we need to be able to get rid of people. Um, yeah, which is kind of what revolution is. That's right. That's why it's such a convenient <clears throat> tool to get rid of people. Because once you see that all these revolutions in the past 230 years are basically the communist dick ideology battling the liberal ideology, mm -hmm. what they have to do is they both have to create propaganda in order to deceive everyone to kill their neighbor. Yeah. That's what they have to do. That's yeah. what revolutions are. Yeah. It is figure out a way to see your neighbor as the enemy so mm -hmm. you can take them out. Mm -hmm. And so the Catholic way of being is counter-revolutionary. Mm -hmm. We don't actually believe in those kind of revolutions. Yeah. Um, because they are, yeah. they are mechanisms of, of ideology. Yeah. Affected through propaganda. And it, it's just a swing. You can, you can track all the revolutions in the past 250 years or mm -hmm. so as just a back and forth between those mm -hmm. two, liberalism, collectivism, mm -hmm. back and forth, back and forth. Well, and counter-revolutionary might even be putting it in a negative way. Like the positive way, I think I was telling you mm -hmm. this before, mm -hmm. is missional. Oh, it's crusade. It's, go, it's crusade, <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. And that word has definitely fallen out of vogue. Yeah. Because we don't understand the crusades, but that's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's 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 cruce right we take the cross take we are, up your cross we yeah. take up the cross or even not our cross but his cross like put him out front because mm -hmm. he's the one that subdues the earth mm -hmm. and again by the mass by the sacramental mm -hmm. grace that he offers the world but that's why you know jesuits lost their lives coming to north america mm -hmm. to 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 people it yeah. You know, to, to bring the mass here, to bring grace to the natives. And boy, did they, they yearn for it. Mm -hmm. And and then eventually, like, the French came and the Spanish, and they intermarried with all the natives and created beautiful That's families. Right. Contrary to the Protestants, that was not the Protestant way of doing it. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be isolated yeah you know and that's kind of why they died but <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know you you marriage and mm -hmm. um you're creating culture together yes yeah. this is how you get the french and spanish cultures in mm -hmm. north america and is it's a very different approach to yeah. um revolution by ideology right and slaughter yeah yeah travis asks what are we all reading from we are reading oh. from The Church and Farming by Father Dennis Fahey. Right there. Yeah. And the... Let's put them both up on the screen. Maybe we'll get a yeah. screenshot of this. It's kind of good. Both yeah. of them. Yeah. That went, right? I mean, I can't. <laughs> the Church and the Land yeah. by Father Vincent McNabb. Travis, those are the books we're reading yeah. from. Yeah, we did a whole episode on The Church and the Farming a couple mm -hmm. months ago, and then now we're doing Father Vincent McNabb, The Church and Land. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really interesting, too, because he goes into one of the big points that Father Fahey keeps making that I'm sort of, I sort of react against is uh, the dignity of the farmer. Okay. And I, I think I react against it because I'm kind of tired of the whole, like, farmer as superstar thing. <laughs> Drives me nuts. <laughs> Uh, but that's yeah. not what he's saying. Uh, he's talking about the dignity of, of the farmer because it is actually quite substantial. Um, when you think about what sort of the place of the human person on the planet is to be. It is as a tender of the garden, a tiller of the soil. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's Adam in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. um, and it's even this cultivation, like that's what, you know, before the fall, all of nature and the animals were subject to Adam, not in slavery, but by virtue of the divinely ordained order mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. And it's because Adam was ordered 
within himself. So you see the order is echoing in every domain of being. And in Adam, his, you know, the, the animals were subject to him because of his original innocence. And his innocence doesn't mean, oh, you know, he's just a blissfully ignorant, uh, you, you know, uh, what's it called? Uh, what was that cartoon? Oh, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, it's not that. It means that he, in himself, his appetites are subject to his will, which is enlightened by his intellect. His appetites never commit revolution and take over mm. and start controlling his thought and directing his will. Mm. So there, there is a hierarchy in the person mm -hmm. because that person is utterly ordered. Mm -hmm. Creation is obedient to him. Wow. see this with the saints oh this is what wallace brought up i get it yeah you see this with saint francis <clears throat> uh -huh. and um saint dominic saint anthony yes saint nicholas yes yeah. creation saint claire was responding right? yeah mm -hmm. to the the order in that individual yes who had attained holiness mm -hmm. or you know justice order towards god mm -hmm. and uh creation recognizes that yeah as a divine signature mm -hmm. of order. Um, so that's that, that is, I think the, the highest way to frame the dignity of the farmer. Okay. Cause if you are, if I mean, this is just, if you aren't ordered and I just know this from personal experience, as a person that struggles with being <laughs> personally ordered, um, it's going to be hard to farm. <laughs> it's going to be hard to grow your food. It's yes. going to be hard to deny yourself when you just want to pound Doritos. Not that I want to pound Doritos, <laughs> but I'm saying if you are not, if you are ruled by your appetites for yeah. lower things, you're going to, you're going to make dumb decisions and the land is not going to respond well to that. Creation is going to rebel against you. Mm -hmm. And that is distilled and crystallized in the farming endeavor. You can mush those lines a little bit in the city. You can be yeah. kind of disordered and get along to go along. But yeah. if you're not getting up early, if you're not milking that cow every day, if you're not, you know, do fill in the blanks forever, mm -hmm. your entire farm system will rebel against you and collapse. And you'll have to go return to the flesh pots of Egypt. Yeah, it's too hard. Yeah, so that order is essential. And I think that's, yeah. that is the high calling of farming. Mm -hmm. is going back to that and then he even brings mm -hmm. up this great ultimately the again ordered towards the hallowing of the name of god which is the very degree to which that seems unrelated to farming <laughs> is a perfect measure of how confused we are <laughs> of how how far we are from actual reality yeah and that's a whole nother podcast oh but, yeah but yeah. because Related to that is our Lord in the Gospel of John. So many of his apostles are, are apostles. His parables are agricultural. Yeah. Like yeah. basically all of them. Mm. Um, and. Or, f yeah, yeah, fishing. <laughs> and so it's, yes, fishing, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a farmer may hold himself to be, to have been specially honored because of what our Lord says when he begins his parable about the vine and the branches, right? I'm the vine, you are the branches. This is in John 15, the mm -hmm. upper room discourse. He's telling the disciples, uh, he's describing to them their relationship to him as a vine mm -hmm. and with its branches and a farmer. And the farmer in this case is pater meus. Mm -hmm. Pater meus agricola est. My Ooh. father is a farmer. Oh. So even God uh -huh. is identified with a farmer. And that, by our Lord, my father is a farmer. That's John 15, 1. Oh, seriously? Yes. Pater meus agricola okay. est. That's really interesting because the Father McNabb has a whole essay dedicated specifically 
to why St. Joseph is not a farmer. Ah, oh, yes. Because he kind of should have been, oh. given what you just said. Interesting. But... Oh, what's the reason? Oh, it's so clever. Oh, no, it's, I, th- I it's have a theory. Because he, he was a mystic, too. Yeah. So he, like, okay, what's your... I have a theory. Did I, I tell you this? I lifted it from him. Okay. So okay. it's not actually my theory. Okay. There is one thing that is uh, permissible, <laughs> you know, like, when you think of the nobility of the work of a farmer, uh-huh. how could you still have uh, that dignity and nobility equal to a farmer but not be a farmer yes and it is to be a servant of farmers oh. which is the christian order right uh-huh. you know those who are for those who would be first should be last and it, yes. you know um and that's what joseph was uh-huh. he was a tecton so yes. he's a carpenter uh-huh. he literally did all a mason you know it was a, it's uh-huh. a broad term it means a tradesman mm-hmm. he did all of the things that are of most Utility uh-huh. to farmers uh-huh. who don't have time to build their smokehouses, for example. That's right. Who don't have time to do anything. Their horse the shoes. Infrastructure. Yeah. Joseph. The farm. The, the, did that. Yes. And so did our Lord. Yeah. Yes. There's so much there. Yeah. Anyway, that that's Father yeah. Fahey's. Well, and and Father McNabb also says um, that the um, the person who works with their hands is like the, the the cousin or the handmaid of the farmer. Right. Like they're yeah. related. It's the same. I mean, a carpenter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're, you're, you're connected to the means of your production, the means How of your... How many yeah. of you are farmers um, who have neighbors or friends who can weld things? And how much do you like them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, that's yeah. like, yeah. come on. It's people who have taken the time mm-hmm. to to learn the craft, to learn how to weld. Yeah, yes. taking the time. Or I'm just thinking of our own neighbors right now. Refrigerants. Yes, the right? refrigeration. Yes. Yeah. Um, Those trades are so so indispensable. Yeah. So that the farmer can focus on that thing which takes all of his time, mm-hmm. which is the cultivation. Yeah. Of the earth. Um. <clears throat> there is so much more could say i don't know where to pivot to but i will look up the other thing that father McNabb says on that Mm -hmm. about why his family his the holy family yeah was not a farming family Mm -hmm. because given everything else like what you just said yeah what was the latin again pater pater meus agricola est Est. yeah okay that's so so beautiful. My father he, is a farmer. He is harvesting us. The, the harvest is plenty and the laborers are that's few. That's in John 15. Yeah, yeah. So that's the passage. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. Which is ultimately what farming is for. Insofar yes. as your body and your soul are united, um, farming is ordered towards the harvesting of souls. Mm-hmm. That's what it's for. Yeah. Can I speak to that really quick? Yeah. So I have another little quote here. Quit most of your fellow men, not because you hate them or despise them, but because you love them so much as to hate the conditions which degrade and enslave them. Do not leave Babylon as hating the Babylonians, but as hating Babylon, which kills the Babylonians. Quit Babylon for the love of Babylonians. And that really hit me Mm -hmm. like a ton of bricks because Mm -hmm. that in a way is the move that we made so that not, not because, you know, we were hating the city, the city dwellers, um, but because it is so hard to save my own soul and in so doing, maybe praying for a few other souls mm-hmm. and meriting the graces that God can then give them to to save their souls. Mm-hmm. Like that they, they can be enlightened just as some poor nun just prayed her heart out for me. I just know it, you know. <laughs> and going into a rural life has enabled my intellect to be enlightened, my will to be strengthened, and my my passions to be ordered because it's quieter out here. Mm. It is literally, it is a monastery for the laity. 
Yeah. So that I can get myself ordered. And then my prayer life can be a little bit quieter, less frenetic, and just more yielding. And then I can pray properly. Mm -hmm. And that is more efficacious. And then that can, that's just cooperating again with God's will Mm -hmm. to, to pray the way he wants me to. Yeah. And for the sake of others, you know, secondarily, ultimately it's for his glory, but it's just more ordered rather than the way a city just, the screen literally fills your imagination and then you can't pray. Yeah. Or, um, when you're just fixated on the delights of the city, then I'm so distracted Mm -hmm. that I can't enter into the harvest of my own soul Mm -hmm. because I'm just, I belong to the flesh pots. Yeah. Well, Mm -hmm. and I feel like that's, um, that is the insane solution of Catholicism that to, to our age seems utterly and most insane that the most practical political and um yeah thing that you can do Mm -hmm. is pray Mm -hmm. that's insane Mm -hmm. if you look at history uh you actually see that when people do that hardcore like not playing around when they make their life a prayer when they and literally like pray all the time without ceasing uh culture is born yeah like it literally happens Mm. and i feel like that if there if we could just you know spreadsheet that one uh it would be inarguable you Mm. look at the monasteries the gift that the monasteries have been to all of civilization and then you know the natural progression from hospitals and universities which are all founded by monastics who pray first Mm -hmm. that is number one hallowed be thy name number one job so you drop everything you drop your advancement in apiary and keeping bees and getting honey and making wax you drop your beer making to go pray Mm -hmm. every time that is number one and it's like you can take it as literally true if you seek first the kingdom of God, everything will be added to you. Yeah. And there is a mechanism, I think, this is me, just my brain talking, but that you can see uh, that makes that work. And it's literally because all things, nothing is divorced from the creator. Nothing is divorced from God because he holds it all in being mm-hmm. every second. Mm-hmm. He holds it all from the brink of annihilation Mm -hmm. every moment every molecule all the time (laughs) so to be praying to the creator is the most practical thing you could do ever Mm -hmm. that is that is that is what heaven is is an endless prayer where we're face to face with him Mm -hmm. and so that that is the most practical by far and the highest prayer we have on earth right now is the mass and so that is literally the key to growing good corn is going to the mass <laughs> and harvesting your pig uh-huh. and um and i think that is actually that is the mechanism I'll seek you first the kingdom of god and all yeah. these things shall be added and right. his justice yeah right and it's it's just so easy <clears throat> to think that, that is an extra thing on the outside Head in hand bear I, bedecked with peace and rosemary. How many people do you know who are building their home culture around seasonal harvest and feasting? Or that are hunting as you are for self sufficiency and back to the land values? Or that share your artist's passion for human scale meat craft? At farmsteadmeatsmith.com, We've created a community of hundreds of omnivores from around the world with these shared goals and two major places for them to learn from and inspire one another. First, we have our semi-annual hands-on educational event, The Family Pig, here at our Heartland Homestead in Oklahoma. Come meet Brandon, get your elbows greasy, and over the course of three days, kill, cut, cure, and cook two pigs 
completely. You'll rub those greasy elbows with other meatsmiths from around the country, sharing meals and conversations to inspire you for years to come. Secondly, for more remote learning, over at farmsteadmeatsmith.com, we host a purely digital membership program with an archive of film and textual resources five years deep now. And both our on-site classes and online program include access to our most unique and rewarding private community Facebook page, Meatsmith Table, which is the only international network by and for homesteaders harvesting animals on a domestic scale using traditional and regional methods. We've been told that our classes are life-changing and the membership program unparalleled in quality and quantity. To get a taste of our education, search farmsteadmeatsmith.com and our YouTube channel for our free films, conversations, and downloads. Explore how we and other meatsmiths across the globe may best come alongside you and support you in building your home around the harvest. Please head to farmsteadmeatsmith.com today. Visit, you know, go visit Clear Creek Monastery and see what the prioritization of prayer looks like. Yeah. It, it's actually beautiful. I mean, one thing it looks like is ext- unbelievable beauty in architecture and music. Like it's, it is, it's not just a bunch of starving, you know, ragamuffins wasting away in the woods. This is, <laughs> it's actually creating culture Mm -hmm. it is yeah Yeah. because it has the the first thing first the hallowed be thy name yes well and i've even i mean you told me i can't remember if i read it but like literally hmm, god is holding together the universe in such a way that when you actually say the lord's name in vain Mm -hmm. it's a miracle that creation doesn't just slap you (laughs) (laughs) doesn't just annihilate you right there yeah yeah because that's holy be thy name. Yeah. You know, yeah. We're, we're, we're like cutting against and that's reality. Why, that's why sin is always contempt of God uh-huh. directly. Uh-huh. It's not just a breaking of his law, which, I mean, it is. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean to minimize that, but it's, it is malice towards God. Because yeah. it's rebelling from his order. Right. In which you live and move and yeah. breathe. Yeah. And that's... That's why it's it's also very dangerous to mm-hmm. say. Uh huh. Not, not good. Yeah. It's funny that you mention if we could just spreadsheet that or work. What did, what did you say? Yeah. Uh huh. Excel. So Father McDonald actually does that. Oh, okay. It's his attempt. What is, I can't. It's, the name of the chapter is Form A One. <laughs> An attempt at a social balance sheet. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he's really witty. He's very writerly. So yeah. almost like Chesterton, not quite as extreme. But yeah. this, I believe that some genius or some saint might draw up a dummy balance sheet whereby the modern man could gauge the soundness or unsoundness of modern civilization. And then he goes on and he's got all these different categories like... How many Mm. families have a home? And he kind of says... Yes. Again, a room or two or three are not a home. Neither are diggings a home, nor lodgings, nor a hostel, nor a hotel. Mm -hmm. If any of my readers does not know what I mean by the word home, God pity him. He proves my thesis. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And even our, um, our shame at having a large home... There's a modern it shame is. associated with that. Mm-hmm. And I think that proves his thesis. Yeah, I think you're right. It's like, no, if there's something that we're going to a shrine in a dignified dwelling, what about a family that is loving and serving each other? Mm-hmm. Maybe if we want to show what is important in society, we could give them a nice big dwelling yeah. where they can live and move. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, but mm-hmm. we're, we're ashamed of that. And I think it's because we suffer from the puritanic ideology of communism. Oh. That small is humble 
And oh, this is why, right. yeah, mm-hmm. post communist, uh, neat, well, yeah, whatever, professors <laughs> would wear denim, would wear jeans, oh, that's right. driving their BMWs to teach at Yale. I know. They wore jeans stubbornly and I not a suit. About that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's puritanical and mm-hmm. um, shame, lots of shame. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah. How many workers live over their work? Mm. Um, This seems a dark saying, but if a man will peer into it, he will find it is a darkness heralding a dawn, a civilization based not on home work, but on factory work is a civilization not resting on its base for the family or home is the unit or base. Therefore, anathema maranatha Mm -hmm. to factory civilization. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know if I read that next part. <laughs> he gets a little colorful in his Okay, I won't, yeah. I'll keep that out. How many... Oh, here's another category. How many mothers or women go out to work? Yes. How many children are in the average family? How many mothers suckle their offspring? Mm. Um, how, many, how much concrete... I love this one. How much concrete is used in building the average house or building? Oh, yeah. His hatred of concrete is very poetic. Yes. Um, how much soot is deposited on each square inch of bread? I like that one. Anyway, yeah. he's got this whole spreadsheet, um, mm-hmm. kind of outlining how we measure yeah. how, how, um, how graceful, how traditional society is. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, I, I know we get, uh, we get Protestants listening to this too. And I said that the mass is the highest form of prayer mm-hmm. that we have on earth. I just as clarification for any Protestant listeners, Mm. the reason that we say that as Catholics is because it is the prayer of Jesus to the Father. Mm. That's why. Right. It's not because we're so good and Catholics Mm. are so good at praying, so much better than everyone else. It's like, no, (laughs) the technical, Uh actual uh, theological reason Mm -hmm. That that is the highest form of prayer is because it is Jesus offering himself to the Father. Mm -hmm. And I know Mm -hmm. every Protestant would agree that's, we can't ultimately The sacrifice of Calvary. Yes. That moment becomes present for us. That's why it's the highest form of prayer. It's our Lord praying to Mm -hmm. his heavenly Father. And we get to be part of that at the Mass. Yeah, we have to do our own mental prayer at home to to make those graces available to us so yeah. we can be disposed rightly you know right but it's not um yeah it, it's we we have to have our own private individual prayer life too also yeah, yeah. um so you, you mentioned this in um or brian holdsworth asked you this question and i think you gave a really good answer but um thoughts on the term benedict option or a a fleeing like you're just fleeing Mm -hmm. the city and it's kind of selfish of you Mm -hmm. to do you know or you know at at worst it becomes an accusation like you're just sort of yeah um escaping the situation i guess we've addressed all this already but the 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 solution on a practical level is what everything we've just described but um it almost becomes a pejorative to, yeah. to 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 say that it's this monastery like Benedict option kind of mm-hmm. fleeing the city and escape at, you know yeah but do you have any thoughts about people that might say that mm-hmm. in a accusational kind of way yeah I don't know I uh, I think that the Benedict option idea as you framed it and i don't know how rod dreyer frames it Mm because i haven't read his book but it's a very useful or heavily used term and i think that in the end that's not even what the benedictines did it's um but it's because the way the universe works too like the most Mm -hmm. social thing you can do is um pray to god alone Mm -hmm. and i know that sounds crazy but that is it's actually just the order of things and it's very simple so if a group of people is let's say a collective of persons the best thing for the collective group 
is for the persons to pray. <laughs> and that's yeah. when that happens, mm -hmm. um, then you have each part of the group, each mm -hmm. individual being ordered. So then they're not going to kill their others <laughs> or hate each other uh -huh. or steal from each other or covet each other's wives, for example. Mm -hmm. or um, not or fail to honor their parents um, or, or steal anything mm -hmm. so it's it is I think it's a matter it's not either or it is well I guess it's that you know it's kind of that Jordan Peters thing thing mm -hmm. priority level of prioritization get your own house in order mm -hmm. make your bed mm -hmm. see to the state of your soul fulfill your obligations first to save your soul, mm -hmm. then uh, you will find yourself being useful to the society. Mm -hmm. Because yes. to the community, <clears throat> even if you're far away from it, yeah. I say this is, again, I think this is the paradox of the history of civilization is that the most useful person in society, useful person to society is St. Anthony of the Desert, mm. who left it all. Yes. And the hermits who stood on pillars for 20 years and prayed like <laughs> they did the most for society mm -hmm. more than anyone yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's because they are technically ordering themselves to the creator mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's the best thing you can do mm -hmm. because he's holding everyone else yeah. in his hand and if you're praying for them it's it's I, I just feel like our the entire history of people bears that out mm -hmm. so it's it's not really a flight from the people or from the good of the people it's a flight from the wickedness from the evil from the temptations mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which come in the form of people or just you know the culture and the propaganda that they produce mm -hmm. uh, in the cities mm -hmm. so in fact um, I started reading ahead on a book uh, that we may talk about at some point. It's uh, it's by Mr. T. L. Flanders. Oh. Mm -hmm. City of God versus the City of Man. Yeah. And um, the introduction, at least, he kind of models his book after Augustine's mm -hmm. City of God. Yeah. Which, I think, and I haven't read that book. I've read other a lot of other Augustine, but not um, City of God. The City of God is in your own soul mm -hmm. that's the city of god it's this space that's totally 100 percent ruled right by god mm -hmm. and that can happen anywhere that can happen on the land it can happen in the city right it can be anywhere oh, yeah. for so much of us we're still like detoxing yeah. from the city so it is easier to do that in the rural life for at yes. least a, for at least a season like saint patrick you know like mm. so many of the saints who started out on the, the rural life to like really hear god's voice yeah and then sometimes god calls them back to the city yeah. you know because they are more stable yeah did i jog something in your brain yeah it just made me think <laughs> of um pilot i mean it mm. it just it crystallizes that equation that you just stated um Milton tries to get at it too mm. in Paradise Regained when he says that uh, the goal, his, his Christ figure in Paradise Regained and his argument with Satan who's tempting him to fall, uh, that you need a paradise within thyself, happier mm -hmm. far. Mm -hmm. And w which is just transposing, you know, well, I'll be good when everything around me is good and all the circumstances are conducive to my well-being mm -hmm. uh, with no actually... Uh, if, if you have a paradise within, then there's no fall outside of you that, that can destroy that. But it's even more crystallized in... Uh, the gospel when um, Jesus says my kingdom is not of this world mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and he's talking to Pilate and uh, Pilate's trying to say so are you a king and Jesus says you say that I am meaning uh, yes 
Yes. For this reason, I came into the world, you know, and, and I'm not going to get the words exactly right, but to bear witness to the truth. That's why mm -hmm. he came. Mm -hmm. And Pilate, who is a governor of men, a Roman governor, trying to ascertain if this man is a king, mm -hmm. he's talking about governance with him. Mm -hmm. He's trying to, like, that's what they're talking about. And Jesus says, yes, I am a king, and I rule by truth. Mm -hmm. Not of this world. <laughs> and mm -hmm. those who are of the truth are in my kingdom. And Pilate has, he just decon, he, he just said like non to Pilate this is nonsense because he's like what, truth, quid es veritas? Mm -hmm. What is truth? Mm -hmm. I don't care. What? Why are you talking philosophy? I don't know what Pilate was thinking, but like why mm -hmm. are you? Who cares? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then, our Lord goes to be mocked, and derided as a king mm -hmm. and crucified and died, and then you have Christendom. Yeah. <laughs> through truth, uh -huh. reigning in each individual. So Pilate thought government governance was the monopoly of violence, uh, you know, of the state forcing order on an unruly populace. That's the history of Rome. Yeah. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. They're darn good at it. Mm -hmm. um, and our Lord is saying, that actually, it's each individual who hears my voice and knows my voice, mm -hmm. who has the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth will reign internally. That's the kingdom. Yeah. And then you get all the glorious kingdoms <laughs> uh -huh. for the last 2,000 years uh -huh. that come out of that. Yeah. So it, it's not a vain, um, you know, poetic conceit. It's not like, oh, but people <coughs> will just be good, so they won't do bad, they won't need government. It's like... Mm -hmm. Pent, you know, our Lord rises from the dead, the Holy Spirit comes, we get Pentecost, and you get Christendom. Mm -hmm. And you do get governments that are governed by truth. In so, and, and you get kings that are striving, hopefully, the best of them, to imitate Christ, ruling through truth. Mm -hmm. um, which is to say, their highest and best duty is to help their people get to heaven. Mm -hmm. Literally, that used to be what the best kings thought mm -hmm. that was their duty. Or at least they're following natural law by yeah. having a king. Right. Yeah. So that, I mean, at least that's, <clears throat> so that's, that's the deconstruction that it's just distilled in that conversation between Pilate and Jesus. Because as incomprehensible as that notion is to us today, mm -hmm. that's what Pilate thought. Mm -hmm. Quid est veritas. Like, why are we talking about this uh -huh. in a context of government? Mm -hmm. Give me a centralized plan <laughs> that we're going to solve this problem. And in, in his context, mm -hmm. his problem was the, uh, the Jews over whom he ruled threatening to revolt. And uh, we have our own problems today, and we tend to go to the centralized planning mm -hmm. rather than the prayer in the desert mm -hmm. where truth reigns. Yeah. And that gives birth to, to culture. Yeah. 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 It's... it's on the surface level, it's easier to centralize plan because you're in yeah. control. You just put some cholerics in charge and <laughs> they'll bulldoze everyone. And But it becomes hyper bureaucratic, even like devouring mother, like I'm a feminist, like overly involved. Yeah. You know, micromanaging. Yes. That's yeah. what I mean. Well, it's because the people don't have virtue. Right. Mm -hmm. And they start mm -hmm. messing with each other. Mm hmm. And yeah. So now you have to make all yeah. kinds of crazy laws mm -hmm. because they're not in the kingdom of Christ mm -hmm. where truth reigns. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, we kind of covered a lot here. I hope we didn't scare anyone off. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but before we sign off, I want, I actually, as I was sort of thinking of questions and topics, um, I had a few recommendations of follow-up resources for our listeners. And the number one that came to me is an essay written by Father McNabb. And it was, um, you can find it on the Return to Tradition YouTube channel. And the gentleman who runs that YouTube channel, he reads it out loud. So it's like an audio version of this essay. 
and it's an apology for returned to return to the land or land work or what he calls hand work too mm-hmm. so it's, they're kind of related as we said um it's a really good it's like 20 minutes long so it's very digestible and he just reads that essay mm-hmm. yeah yeah and actually if you Look up a few other, if you just type in Father McNabb, a few other interesting YouTube Mm -hmm. things will come up. Um, Let's see. There's a couple other book recommendations. I don't know if we'll have the time to go over them Mm -hmm. here because I can sense that our conversations are drifting into other places. But some couple of related books are these two right here. Would you flee to the fields? Would you recommend these? Some of them, they're kind of, uh, they're not well edited, and so they can be confusing. Mm, okay. Um, and yeah, I'm not familiar I'll with I'll just say them. them. They're Flee to the Field. They're from a good publishing house, mm-hmm. so uh, I think Loretto. Yeah. And actually, I would recommend Loretto Publishing Company. Yeah. They great. have really good, um, they have, I guess I bring them up because their stuff is on social critique, but from a Catholic like from a traditional approach Mm -hmm. so not communist not overly liberal either Mm -hmm. it's sort of this yeah straight and narrow it's it's the pre yeah um but they have so these two books are a compilation of essays written by a lot of these names like father McNabb is in these Mm -hmm. the rural solution but you also get some distributed stuff Mm -hmm. i don't know that much about it i can't say officially i'm a distributist i'm probably not but um but a lot of the Chestertonian, Belloc flavor type, mm-hmm. if you're into that. And they have appropriate social critiques on the state of agriculture yeah. and industrialization. And again, mm-hmm. like the rural solution. It's a great title, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> the other one by Father McNabb is Nazareth or Social Chaos. Oh, I haven't read that one. I haven't read it either. Oh. I would like to. Yeah. I just mention it because... He's a very prayerful, mystic person himself, and he's on the spot. He's maybe not as technical as mm-hmm. a Father Fahey, yeah. as you said. Which is funny, because he's Dominican. I know. He should be pretty technical. <laughs> yeah. But he sees the problem, and he's yeah. He's um, di- trying to diagnose it. Um, would would you recommend Apostolic Farming by Catherine Doherty? That one's all right. She's got mm-hmm. some nice... It's, it's super not technical. Yeah. It's really um, winsome. Kind of anecdotal, yeah. too. Her history is amazing, though. She mm-hmm. is a relic, even though she's not that old. This is just how quickly our age has moved. But she is the Russian girl that grew up in her family's land on her family's land where she was born where her parents grandparents great-grandparents great-great-grandparents were born all on the same property it's ancestral land Hmm. and uh, she is the one she tells beautiful stories about the management the multi-generational management of their property that's another whole Hmm. immense reason why the family is the environmental solution to environmental degradation because it's multi-generational, mm-hmm. which means the inheritance of the firstborn is also, the firstborn male is also essential to the preservation of the multi-generation of the family. Because mm-hmm. if you just break it up amongst all your children, then they're going to sell it off and turn it into legal tender again. <laughs> it ruins its ding. ugly head. <laughs> and you're, yeah. the land is gone. It's just turned into cash. Um, so anyway, she paints she tells she talks about her childhood that's what's cool about that book Mm -hmm. and the specific techniques of like how they treated that field um for three generations right that's her that's right and how it was even planned from her great grandfather to uh fell a particular forest uh when his you know when she was born when his great great granddaughter would be born uh-huh. and that was the marker that's how long the land needed to rest so that's the kind of multi-generational farming they were talking about all of which was obliterated by the communist revolution hmm. the soviets who thought that they had too much that they shouldn't have that it should be 
dispersed among everyone else. Mm -hmm. And so they took it all and they lost everything. And she came to uh, the United States and started the Madonna house. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. I believe that's Catherine Doherty. Mm -hmm. So yeah, not, she's not terribly precise, but she talks about the ingenuity of love in the context Mm -hmm. of farming, Mm -hmm. which is a useful context, I think. Mm -hmm. Good word. Yeah. I think that's a wrap. Okay. Yeah. That's a beautiful summation, I think, uh, apology <laughs> or <laughs> argument for m- moving your soul, your family in such a way that mm-hmm. you find the quiet of the rural life for the building up of your own family, of Christendom, of... Um, for the good of the Babylonians. Yeah. Yeah. It works for that too. Yeah. And it tastes really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Which is okay. Right. You can have the material good too. That's uh-huh. the thing. Uh-huh. We're just talk we're talking about the order of creation also. Uh-huh. So the bacon that you make is objectively superior to the bacon you buy. And I don't need to argue that with these <laughs> listeners, but that it's uh-huh. that's because it's part of this order. It's because mm-hmm. you are the best maker of bacon. Mm-hmm. You're the best killer of your pig. It's your pig. Mm-hmm. It's ordered towards you, the good of your family. And you don't have to overly spiritualize those things for them to still be good. They are mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. The goods of the body are goods. <laughs> <laughs> They're good. They are good. Just thank God and eat good bacon. Yeah. yeah. Come to our goose class and find out. Yeah. Okay. We'll do that there too. <laughs> Thank you again, Meat Smiths, for listening to our take on all things meat making, householding, and culture keeping. We hope it's helped you in growing your home around the harvest.